When was the last time you learned how to stop a serious bleed? If you're like most people, especially the ones outside of the tactical enthusiast community, the answer is probably never. <laughs> At some point, most people have heard the basics such as you know, apply direct pressure, or they know what bandages and tourniquets as a thing, but they never use them. And as you and I know, there's often a significant difference between knowing that the thing exists and actually knowing how to use it in an emergency. And that is what we're talking about today. So welcome to the Everyday Marksman, the podcast where it's all about tactical skills for living a more adventurous life. I'm your host, Matt Robertson, former military officer turns tech sector corporate grunt, now a shooting enthusiast, outdoors nerd, blogger, podcaster, and all round weirdo. <laughs> Our website's everydaymarksman.co. And there you're going to find today's show notes, as well as our community of marksmen, our other podcast episodes, our YouTube channel, and all of our articles. Now, before I get into the meat of today's episode, I'd want to throw a shout out towards Ammo Squared. Now, this is not a sponsored arrangement, but I do want to tell you about them, because I'm sure you have felt the pain of trying to stalk for the best price of ammo. Now, I learned a long time ago through uh, investing for retirement accounts that the best way to do it is to be automatic about it, to put money in a low cost index fund and let the thing build over time. Uh, and Ammo Square does that with ammunition. You feed your account every month with $25, $50, $100, whatever you can contribute. Uh, you tell a, an arrangement of what percentage you want to buy. And over time, you can accrue ammo. I just got my first big box of ammo recently loaded with 22, 223 and nine millimeter for practice. And it was great because I paid them my money every month. They built my stockpile. And once it reached $250 worth, they sent it to me for free. Perfect. Now, if you want to check out information on the website, I did a whole review of this. It's at everydaymarksman.co forward slash ammo. Or if you want to jump right into it, you can go to mosquared.com forward slash marksman and you can get a $20 credit towards your first crate. So check them out. And with that, let's get on to the meat. Now, a while back, I talked to Doc Larson of One Shepherd about building a minimum capable citizen or a minimum capable skill set for prepared citizens. Now, as we got into the conversation, the very first thing he thought we should learn was first aid. Uh, you know, first and foremost, your most immediately is going to be first aid, right? So because you don't know that you're going to have either a hospital or medical professionals available to you for quite some time. So go into advanced stages of first aid, right? Um, and going into that training also, go, uh, you know, it implies and informs what you need to stock up on too. Um, the training then tells you what's going to be relevant in that. Um, so yeah, aid, big one, first aid. Now his reasoning here was really sound. We're all far more likely to have to use first aid skills in an emergency than we are before shooting skills. You know, that could look like an accident in the kitchen or a car crash, a natural disaster or a camping trip gone wrong. None of those things immediately require care under fire, but you still have the opportunity to save someone's life provided you have the skills. Now, a little bit after that, I published the Everyday Marksman Gear Acquisition Hierarchy. Again, links in the show notes here. The point was establishing a general order of purchase for equipment. And along with that came several suggestions for training. The lowest level of this pyramid, I put basic first aid. You know, and my suggestion for that was a stop the bleed course. They're offered all over the country. They're low cost. Um, anybody can do it. Now, that course is enough to teach anyone the bare basics and point them in the right direction of the equipment that they're going to need. But that by itself is actually not all the way there. Because what comes next is something like a combat lifesaver course where they're going to teach tactical combat casualty care, TCCC. A lot of places teach this to civilians, law enforcement, military alike. Now, as, a, as another layer beyond that one, I suggest something like, like a wilderness first aid course is they have this emphasis on treatment when emergency care is not immediately available. You'll find that this further lets you know what else you have to add to your kit. You know, and I bet it's going to be beyond what most of us think of as our quote unquote blowout kit. So what actually goes into our first aid kits for a minimum capable citizen? Well, I have a couple assumptions here. If you're new to the podcast, I also talk about something called scenario X, which is a fictional situation in which there's been a natural disaster 
And it's been several months and the government has all but kind of shut down on us because there's just not enough power and people to go around. So you and your neighborhood are on your own to supply your food, take care of your water needs, your own security, your own first aid, you know, all of those things that go into keeping a small civilization running, you're on your own. But my assumption here is that even in that environment, you can still get to the hospital if you need to. And that's an important one because as we go into talking about massive hemorrhage and using tourniquets and things, you know, all that makes the assumption is that you've got somewhere to take the person who's been shot. If you're shot in the woods and you have a tourniquet on your leg and and you can't get to a hospital, you're probably going to die anyway. All right. Just just saying that. Um, So I'm going to assume that you can do some first aid and you get that person somewhere helpful. All right. So let's just start with that assumption. Now, let's divide first aid for prepared civilians into two categories. The first is the most severe, and that includes traumatic injuries like gunshots, impalements, massive hemorrhage, or things that we like to think of as tactical first aid. This is what most of us build our first aid kits around our IFACs. Now, I'm not an expert on this, so I talked to my friend Justin of Swiss Island Deadly. Now, he's a former Marine Special Operations member with a variety of skills and currently spends time working as an EMT. He boiled down the basics to only a few items. So we can sum up TCCC in like four, three or four statements. And they are, if there is an uncontrolled extremity bleed, put a tourniquet on it. If there is a hole in the torso, the life box, put a sticker on it, which would be a chest seal. And if there is a bleed in a junctional area, like the joints between, you know, where the arms meet the torsos or the legs meet the torso, pack it with a hemostatic agent. And that essentially is TCCC in a nutshell. And that's his minimalist kit. Tourniquet, chest seals, and hemostatic agent. Now, I also include compression bandage on here. We did talk about that. And he said, it's a nice to have. You know, if you don't have the room for it because you're using one of those really tiny first aid kits, then that's the first thing to go. I think if you could get one of the rid of one of those three things, it would be the compression bandage. Um, Because generally, if it's a serious extremity bleed, a tourniquet will fix the problem. So I like to add that compression bandage like the North American Rescue bandage or the Israeli bandages. or There's a bunch of them out there. The other thing I always like to add is a pair of nitrile gloves. Now, if you have a bit more room, there are a few more items that I think are also good to have in your first aid kit, besides those minimalists. Um, you know, aside from, there's the trauma dressing, I already mentioned, the compression bandage, uh, compressed gauze, so not hemostatic gauze, but something like just regular old you know, gauze, a triangle bandage, medical tape, an nasopharyngeal airway or MPA, trauma shears, a marker, and a casualty card. That kind of fills out the rest of your first aid kit. All those things end up giving you a much more complete package. And there's a whole lot more you could put away than that. But at some point, we have to find a balance between how much stuff we want to keep at the ready and how much space it's going to take up on the gear. Now, with the notable exception of the Minuteman harness, uh, which I've been showing a bunch of pictures of, I try to keep my emergency kits to no more than two columns wide of Molly. And that's naturally going to limit the amount of space I let my first aid kit take up and how much I can put into it. So even the flat first aid kit I've got in the back of my harness on one of my kits doesn't hold a whole lot. Um, So that gets to the other first aid kit, the boo-boo kit. Now, while talking to Justin, he mentioned he had cut himself with a saw about 10 days before our conversation. I put a uh, little two-inch gash on my leg the other day with a saw, Uh, irrigated it really well, um, cleaned it really well, washed it out with soap and water, steri-stripped it closed, Uh, And then today, yesterday on day 10, I started noticing a little heat and redness around it. So like, man, a little thing like that, uh, and in any kind of like in a scenario X type situation, like you can burn through quite a bit of supplies, just taking care of something like that, that if it's not taken care of could be like life threatening. So that's the interesting thing here. You know, the emergency first aid kit that we all love to talk about should not be the only piece of first aid gear available to you. While getting shot or stabbed is certainly an emergency that needs dealing with right now, there are plenty of other things that can and will kill you just as dead if you aren't prepared to deal with them. Now, for this reason, you should also have a secondary first aid kit, you know, for non-emergency supplies. 
I like to call this a boo-boo kit. And it contains a lot of typical household or outdoors first aid supplies that you might expect, like antiseptic wipes, antibacterial ointments, you know, fabric bandages, butterfly closures, gauze pads, medical tape, moleskin for blisters, insect sting and bite kits, tweezers, safety pins, um, you know, painkillers, anti-inflammatories, anti-diarrhea meds, a Mylar survival blanket, and a hand warmer with some lighter fluid. Now that last one is a little bit of a, a, an eye scratcher, <laughs> eye scratcher, a head scratcher. I had not heard that one until I got some advice from a member of our own community when we were talking about this in the Discord server. So shout out to Yella for this advice. He mentioned that most people know about the body temperature dropping when someone's losing a lot of blood. Uh, but there's something called the triangle of depth or the, the trauma triad that consists of hypothermia, acidosis, and coagulopathy. And this is a sequence of events that ultimately kill somebody. The first one is their body temperature drops. And when body temperature drops, the blood becomes more acidic. And the blood becomes more acidic, it stops the blood from clotting, which then reduces the effectiveness of trying to save their life. Now, the Mylar blanket would help with this if the body was producing enough heat to actually warm it up. So Yella mentioned just keep taking along that little little uh, lighter fluid powered hand warmer and sticking it in there with the patient when they're under that Mylar blanket to help provide that heat. So something to keep in mind. So all of those first aid supplies, the, the boo-boo kit ones, I just throw those in a you know, a sandwich freezer bag, something that's generally going to be protected from the elements and stick that in a pocket or in a backpack and keep it out of the way. So let's go back to talking about our primary blowout kits. What, what do I look for in that? What are my favorites? Now in military units, there is typically standard operating procedures, SOPs that dictate where things get carried and what goes into the kit. All right. So everybody's standard about that one. Now as civilians, you and I, don't really have to worry about that um, for better or worse. We're on our own to do what we like, how we like to do it. And that means that there's a lot of variety out there. <laughs> so over the last several months, uh, with your support through Kofi and affiliate links, I've been able to test out a lot of first aid kit pouches and figure out what works best for me. And I want to share some of my thoughts with you today. Um, by the way, if you do want to help support for little projects like this, it's just go to everydaymarksman.co forward slash support, and that'll take you to our support page. Thanks. All right. Now along the way, I learned a few little preferences. So I'm going to set these up now. First, I much prefer to have some kind of module that is removable or tears away. Um, I don't like to have to, you know, if, if I've got a first aid pouch on my right side and my right arm is not usable, I don't really dig around with my left arm trying to find you know, first aid supplies. So I really want something that I can remove and open up right in front of me and deal with it there. So that's important. It goes along with the idea of keeping your kit accessible to both hands. All right. Second, I don't want my pouches to be very bulky. All right. So my general sizing here is I want them taking up no more than two columns wide of Molly. Shouldn't be more than about one AR-15 magazine tall and no more than three magazines deep. Think about something like the size of an Alice magazine pouch. Hint, hint. Now, lastly, I want my first aid kit to be obvious. You know, going back to that second point, it's easy to use an existing magazine pouch like the uh, classic Alice pouch or even the Velocity Systems Jungle pouches I've got. Um, it's really easy to use one of those as your first aid kit. In fact, it's a great idea. Uh, you know, the medical modules I'm going to talk about actually can fit into those pouches. So it's really convenient. The trouble is, unless there's a standard procedure so that everybody knows that the second magazine pouch on your right is your first aid kit, it's not obvious. So I want some kind of obvious marking on the outside. So to me, that usually looks like a little patch of Velcro where I can throw on a, a red cross. And I've got a bunch of pictures on the show notes for this episode where you can see examples of what this looks like. So with that said, what are my favorites? Number one is the ATS Tactical Slimline Micro. I have two of these. One's on my primary battle belt and the other is on my general purpose patrol harness. Separate articles or separate podcast episodes of what those look like. It's a two-part system with an outer zippered pouch and an inner folded up module. So when you want to get into this thing, you yank the zippers down and that exposes a big red grab handle and you can yank the whole module out of the pouch and then work with it right in front of you. 
really nice slim design doesn't take up much space and it holds a lot more stuff than some of the other com really compact pouches I've used before that take up the same amount of space. So it's a really great design. I also discovered that the insert perfectly fits inside of a Velocity Systems Jungle 556 magazine pouch. So bonus if I ever wanted to do it that way. My second favorite pouch here is also from ATS. It's their small medical pouch, Narrow. They actually have two versions of their small medical pouch. I have both. Uh, the narrow one is narrow because it only takes up two columns of molly as opposed to three on the other one. Now, this one's a slightly different design because it is not a zippered enclosure. Instead, the two parts to it, there's a base that's attached to the molly. It's got a big uh, hook side on it or hook or a loop or one of them. But basically, it's it's got a big Velcro patch on it. And then the, the, the actual module also has a big hook of Velcro on it and the two stick together. And then you have a closure across the top and a fast text buckle. So when you want to get into your pouch, you release the fast, fast text buckle and then opens up to a big red grab handle, yank it, rip it off the, the backing and the clamshells open in front of you. Holds quite a bit more stuff than the other ATS micro, quite a bit more stuff. It's a very slightly larger. It's just really nice design. It was built around the actual U.S. Army's first aid kit supplies. So, you know, that tells you who their market was for that. Now, my third favorite here does break from my rules a little bit, and that's the Esso Tech Viper Flat Mini. So I actually also have both the Mini and the full-size Viper A1. I much prefer the size of the Mini, which is three columns wide and about four columns tall. The Viper A1 is four columns wide and a little bit taller. Now, the reason I like this pouch is it's just a great option for putting on your back. It's easy to grab with either hand from the side. So the way this pouch works is you can just reach behind you. You can grab either handle. It's exposed both the left and the right, and you just slide it out of a sleeve. And the whole thing just folds open and access all your stuff. Again, I have pictures of all these things in the show notes. So those are my three favorites, two from ATS, the Slimline Micro, and the small, narrow pouch, and one from SO Tech, the Viper Mini. Now, I did not mention tourniquets yet because I do keep my tourniquets separate. So for tourniquet pouches, my favorite here is the T3 Gear. Uh, it's like a little burrito that you can stick on your gear. It fully encloses the tourniquet. Enclosing your tourniquet is important because you want to keep it out of the elements. And I, I don't just mean dirt and mud, which is important, but also just sunlight. Uh, over time, UV rays can weaken the plastics and the webbing that are on your tourniquet. And you won't know that it's been weakened too much until you try and cinch it down and it snaps. That's bad news. You don't want that. So protect your tourniquet. For a secondary tourniquet, sure, you can throw in like a field expedient rubber band or something like that. But you know, go ahead and protect your primary one with something that's enclosed. All right, that is going to wrap up my advice on this episode. Let's recap a little bit. We've discussed some baseline medical training. I gave you three options there. You want to start with stop the bleed. Then you want to go to uh, care under fire or combat or combat lifesaver, and then check out wilderness medical. We talked about some of the bare minimum first aid supplies you should have in your trauma kit. So things like a tourniquet, perfectly more than one tourniquet. You want to have a hemostatic agent and you want to have chest seals, more than one. And I like the vented ones. Then we talked about my favorite pouches for carrying your blowout supplies, as well as a bunch of other stuff like your boo-boo kit and what that looks like. So rounding this out, thank you for joining me today. It's been a pleasure hanging out with you. Come by the website, everydaymarksman.co. There you're going to find today's show notes, all of the pictures, and I posted a lot of pictures to this article. Uh, for this podcast episode, as well as our big green fat subscribe button so you can get on the mailing list. And that gets you an invite to the Discord server where you, could, you too can hang out, have conversations with a lot of experts in the field like Yella, shout out, as well as many more competitive shooters and you know, just people who want to be prepared marksmen like you. That's enough out of me. Take care. Have a great week. I will catch you next time.